Welcome to Onward on this uh, beautiful day. And uh, we're glad that you're here. We're glad those of you joining us online, a special welcome. And uh, we have a special speaker this morning, which we're uh, excited about. We'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, presentation from Creation Ministries. And uh, so this morning, as we get started, I, I was thinking of Psalm 150, verse 6. It says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And uh, I, I love that invitation. So how many people have breath here? Do you have breath? Put your hand. <laughs> All right. If you don't, you're, you're in trouble. Um, so let's stand. And the Bible also says, if we don't praise the Lord, the rocks will cry out. So I don't want any rocks praising God in, in place of me this morning. And uh, so let's sing these songs of worship. The first one is, uh, Christ is Enough. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the gift of music, the chance to sing and worship you together. I pray for each one here and those coming and those joining online, that they would be blessed and encouraged in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. And now there's nothing in this world that could ever satisfy love. Through every trial, my soul will You are 
enough songs could be sung, but we thank you, especially for what you've done. You sent Jesus to come in this world, die on the cross, rise again in victory, and it's in his name that we pray and dedicate this time to. Amen. Amen. You may be seated.
Well, good morning, church. It's a beautiful day. It's good to see so many people out uh, here this morning, people we haven't seen for a while. Good to see David. Good to see Pierre. It's Pierre's birthday tomorrow. Happy birthday, Pierre. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking like about 40th, is that it? Is it the big 4-0? I'm close. Within a decade or two? Three. He's 70th, wow, happy birthday. If you are new here this morning, uh, we welcome you. If you're new and watching, we welcome you. But if you're here in person and you're new, um, please uh, come say hi to Pastor Brian after the service or myself, my name's Anthony, I'm an elder here. And I just hope that we stick around after church a little bit to have some conversations, maybe some deep ones, maybe some just talking about the weather. I would encourage you as well to go downstairs. Maybe you can mill around uh, the table, the Creation Ministries table. Uh, and that segues into my first announcement. Uh, we have a guest speaker, Gus Olsthorn, with Creation Ministries. Welcome, Gus. Um, after the service, we invite you downstairs to browse the books and DVDs and other resources on biblical creation as a special way to encourage the children and the teens to grow in their faith. They can go with their parents, or if they're teens, I guess they can just go, I don't know, uh, and choose an item up to $20 value, and, and when they go to the checkout, the cost will be uh, taken care of by the church. So, so if you're children or teens, if you're 20, I guess, I don't know, that doesn't count. I don't know how literal we're going to be. But we encourage everyone to take advantage of this great opportunity uh, and have a look at the resources uh, downstairs. We're also, um, the sun, for Sunday school this morning, the 9 to 12 year olds, I'm, I'm told they're called Rooted. Is that it? That's good? Rooted. That's good. Uh, they are going to stay to hear this uh, important um, sermon this morning. So again, uh, after the service, you can go downstairs and if you're, in your, if you're let's say, from 2 to 19, uh, $20 value. There's a lot of resources. My boys were looking at it before. There's a really nice one on dragons that they were kind of eyeing. Uh, you can have a look at some great resources there. The second announcement this morning um, is uh, that on June the 1st at 7 p.m., we're going to be screening a documentary on the persecuted church in Iran. It's going to be here, so that's a Wednesday, 7 p.m., uh, June the 1st. Something incredible is taking place in Iran. Uh, ironically, in this Islamic Republic, the Christian church is growing rapidly, in secret, but rapidly. While the good news, uh, uh, while this is good news for followers of Jesus, the mullahs of Iran have responded with predictable and serious repercussion. Government officials keep a close eye on those who leave Islam. They have arrested and imprisoned many believers for abandoning their original faith. We have people attending this church who have firsthand experience of that repression and that persecution. To reduce visibility, Christians meet in homes and in small groups, and they study the Bible in secret. Some believers manage to escape oppression, but most cannot leave Iran, and they are part of a growing but increasingly persecuted church there. To help you become better acquainted with what God is doing in this country, we invite you to a special viewing of a documentary entitled The Persecuted Harvest, and it's produced by House of Omid, which is an Iranian Christian ministry based in Burnaby, BC. House of Omid, Omid means uh, hope in Persian, is in direct contact with Iranian believers in Iran. It's a 45-minute documentary, and it contains rare and sensitive footage it will inspire you to a greater level of prayer to support this persecuted church in support of the persecuted church. Because of the security issues surrounding what is uh, shared in the documentary, it will not be recorded or live streamed. So it can only be viewed in person. So I really encourage you to come out. I think it's going to be a pretty special night. Um, I remember, uh, uh, I hadn't planned to say this, but just quickly, uh, many years ago, I went on a missions trip uh, with a church I was attending, and it was kind of intergenerational. There were several of us, and we went to Athens to serve um, refugees that were, at that point, often coming from Iran and Iraq. They were Kurdish and Afghanistan. 
And uh, it was sort of a, a refugee center that was feeding them and clothing them and giving them English uh, uh, lessons. And in preparation, we watched uh, a film about one family's dangerous trip trying to go from an area in the Middle East through Turkey and into Europe and how difficult it is, how treacherous it can be to cross the Aegean Sea like in a, in a little raft or to go another way. Um, so I would really encourage you to come watch this because I think it can, it's really important that we're praying uh, for the persecuted church. So that's June the 1st at 7 p.m. and onward and it will be followed by a Q&A and a time of prayer for Iran. Don't miss this uh, unique opportunity. Um, just a few other things are, are, are just our regular uh, weekly ministries. Tonight, uh, the adults, young adults uh, with Adrian uh, Bisson at 7.30. Um, that's on Zoom, right? On Zoom. Uh, Wednesday, Bible study in the parables with Pastor Brian on Zoom at 7 p.m. Thursday, discipleship class with Ray at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Friday youth group not on Zoom, in person here with Adrian, the church at 7. And Awana continues every Friday on Zoom. I, I wanted to just segue back, if I could, just to what I was talking about. A couple of things. I, I, again, I know I plug these little, they're, they're such quick reads, but it really, it does talk about what's going on right now in the persecuted church, the church around the world. We have it for every month. We, we get them in there at the back, and you can read about that. I wanted to just read a couple of uh, scripture passages before, as we move into our time of prayer. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3.12, this is for all of us, all, all who call on Jesus as our Lord and Savior. Indeed, all who want to live in a godly way in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And Jesus tells his followers in John 15, verses 19 to 20, if you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember what I told you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. Let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we do come before you. We thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for the freedom to worship and gather in person, together to worship your holy name. We pray for those who are experiencing persecution because of their faith, who cannot gather together, or who, for whom it is very difficult to gather together. We pray that you would comfort and encourage them, and we pray for revival, Lord. We know that <clears throat> in persecution is uh, often where your word uh, is received in greatest number. For the church in Iran in particular, and for other nations that are close to the gospel, we just pray for the church and for the individual believers. We pray that would, revival would come amidst persecution. We pray for our missionary Tezkan and his work in the Middle East, um, those that he is witnessing to and discipling who've come to know you as their Lord and Savior. We pray for his protection as he shares the good news of salvation in Jesus' name. There are many needs uh, in our congregation we think of uh, Sarah Salzani. We thank you, Lord, that she is, uh, you laid it on her heart to go serve as a nurse in the Ukraine with Samaritan's Purse. We pray that you would protect her. We pray for you would help her to be a witness again with the, the hands and feet of the gospel of peace in the Ukraine. We pray for the people in the Ukraine, Lord, for the suffering that they're going through. We pray for an end to the conflict. Uh, we pray for the Christians there again, Lord, that um, um, they would be salt and light amidst the persecution that they are enduring. We pray for our brother Stan's surgery on June the 21st to remove his cancerous tumor, that it would be successful in Jesus' name. We pray for Muriel as she uh, cares for him, Lord. For Glenda and her upcoming foot surgery, that it would be a successful surgery free from any complications. We give you praise uh, that Alma has found a new home uh, where she can be provided for, and we continue to pray for her rehabilitation. For Ray's son-in-law, Charles, we pray for the doctors as they treat his kidney difficulties with blood transfusions and dialysis, and we pray for a healing, Lord, so that he can 
be recovered and get back to work as he provides for his family. There are so many other needs that we can think of, and I know that there are concerns and worries on our hearts right now here, those who are here in Verdun at Onward, those who are listening at home, and I just pray, Lord, as we cry out to you, that you would hear our cries. Help us to remember that you have answered our prayers in the past. I pray that we would remember that. Those moments, those times where you delivered us from temptation or you delivered us from some struggle or you healed us. And we would draw on that and indeed even tell others about that as a witness to your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for creation. We thank you for beauty. I've been thinking about that a lot, about the beauty of your created world, the beauty of art, the beauty in song. All of this comes from you, Lord. We pray this morning for Gus Olsthorn as he speaks from your word on the truth of your creation, your created world. According to your word, Lord, you have made everything, meaning all creation, appropriate in its time, and you have set eternity in the human heart. And so as Gus preaches, I pray that that would really speak to us. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through him in Jesus' name. As the offering comes, may we be generous as you have gifted us with all good things. May we give back to you, Lord. And thank you for this time. Thank you for this time that we can come together and worship in your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, I think we have an offertory song, and we'll call the ushers to come forward. And again, the, just the, the younger Sunday school group can go to Sunday school now. Thank you. Thank you, Heather. Well, this morning it is uh, a privilege to announce and uh, introduce the speaker, uh, Gus Olsthorn, a Creation Ministries speaker. And uh, it's not his first time at Onward. You may remember about four or five years ago he came. Uh, and we, in fact, had scheduled him to come to Onward in March 2020. But you all know what happened in March 2020. It was basically COVID hit and uh, things were disrupted. But uh, we scheduled him again in February of this year, or maybe it was March even, and uh, then he got COVID <laughs> and couldn't come. So there's one thing after another. Well, today, finally, uh, he's here, and we're thankful for that. Uh, Gus is a licensed aircraft uh, maintenance engineer, currently retired after 45 years in the aviation industry. Uh, for over 25 years, he was a technical instructor on Bombardier's business aircraft and had been developing online technical training for Bombardier and most recently CAE, uh, the world leader in aviation training for commercial and military aircraft. Gus is also a founding member of Creation Science Association of Quebec, and he's passionate about helping people see that the Bible is trustworthy. Amen? 
and it is especially in regards to the six-day creation account and the global flood, and there is good scientific evidence to support this, which he will be sharing today. Uh, Gus has been married to his wife, Debbie, for 41 years, and we're welcome to welcome Debbie as well here sitting in the back. They have five, uh, four grown sons and uh, five grandchildren, I believe, and uh, a few of them are here today. So welcome to the grandchildren, and uh, they live here in the Belle Province, and uh, <coughs> please join me in giving a warm welcome to Gus Olsler. Thank you, uh, Pastor Brian. Yes, uh, I remember all of your faces from the last time I was here. <clears throat> so uh, today we're going to be talking about the creation evolution question. And um, so I've entitled this, If the Bible is True. <clears throat> if the Bible is true, well, that is the question we are discussing today. And the reason that this is being asked is because many in our world, certainly in a society as secular as Quebec, the feeling is that, no, the Bible is not true. One of the main reasons, so it is believed, is that science has quite clearly shown us that it, it was not God who made us, but rather evolution, that grand theory of how everything came into being. So Creation Ministries International, of which I'm a part-time speaker, uh, is in seven countries around the world. We have more PhD scientists on staff than other Christian, other Christian ministries. Our information department reviews all the major science journals. Our speakers travel all over Canada, including me. I was in Okanagan Valley with my wife uh, a couple months ago, and next weekend I'll be in Manitoba. So I get a lot of air miles from that. And uh, they also have the weekly uh, <clears throat> TV show. So we have a full-fledged website, uh, lots of information, lots of free resources, over 12,000 articles on it, and um, a very simple web page, web address, creation.com. <clears throat> so have you been told the whole truth about the theory of evolution and those billions of years? What can we make of the theory of evolution, this near universally held view that natural processes have, over billions of years since an alleged Big Bang, caused all the particles of an expanding universe to collect in such wonderful arrangements that explains the origin of everything, from galaxies to giraffes, coconuts to cows, and pelicans to people. All this, we are told, is without the need to invoke any kind of supernatural being, especially a god. <clears throat> Naturally, given this grand claim, we who say we believe in a creator god have a serious challenge on our hands, <clears throat> especially if we're going to maintain the claim that the Bible is true. And this is what we're going to discuss today. And one of the first uh, questions we're going to ask is, well, let's look at some of the claims. For example, uh, we are told things fossilize, turn into fossils. We're told that, according to National Geographic, something can, needs at least 10,000 years for a preserved creature to turn into a fossil. Is that true? Well, the actual science says, no, that's not. In fact, it can happen almost instantly. <clears throat> well, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? And what about, uh, I speak in Alberta and have lots of oil over there, and oil is underground, and how did it get there? Well, according to a National Geographic, it says over millions of years, high pressure and high temperature, the remains of these organisms transform into what we know today as fossil fuels. But in fact, is that actually true? Well, science actually shows that you can actually get from organic material crude oil in less than an hour. Hmm. Which then begs the question, can people farm, uh, create crude oil? Yes, there's somebody in the United States is working at farming algae for the purpose of creating crude oil. And uh, I found this on Google. Somehow Google knows the type of things that I'm interested in. I don't know how it works, but it, it's awesome. And just so happened to come up with this uh, article on a four-legged whale fossil found. Now the reason that's interesting is because the reigning idea is that how we got whales in the ocean is that because Many, many, many years ago, millions of years ago, a land animal decided to take a swim and liked it and stayed there for over 10 million years and slowed that time became a whale. And so this is, they, they say, claim, evidence of a transitional form between a four-legged land animal and a whale. So this was broadcast around the world. Everybody looks at it and says, well, look, we have more evidence, more proof of this claim of the theory of evolution. We'll look at this later on, what it actually 
showed. However, we at Creation Ministries, and many of you as well, are convinced that the Holy Scriptures are inerrant and infallible and can be understood without special knowledge or education. In other words, you don't need a PhD, you need, don't need to go to seminary to make sense out of the Bible. I mean, most of the people that Jesus talked to were just ordinary people like you and me, fishermen and uh, tax collectors. Hopefully none of you are in that field. But uh, <clears throat> So these were ordinary people. And in fact, the highly educated ones were the ones that resisted Jesus, well, to the point of having him put to death. So we believe that you can read the scriptures for yourselves and understand that God had made everything in six days about 6,000 years ago. Where do we get that 6,000 years? It's from the genealogy from Adam. Adam was 130 years when he had Seth. Seth lived so many years and began, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to, well, to us, to Jesus. And of course, we know when Jesus was on the earth. So what does the Bible tell us about this whole origins question? Well, one of the things it starts off with, very famous verses, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, which is the Hebrew way of saying the universe, the cosmos, everything. God made everything. He starts off with that, and then he starts giving details. Well, one of the details is he started making light and darkness. There was evening and morning the first day. And then he also made mankind in his image. We aren't just animals that evolved from over millions of years. We're actually specially created in the image of God. That sets us apart from any, every other being. People who believe in evolution said, well, that's not true. We're just animals. The Bible also tells us that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. And this is referring, of course, to Jesus Christ. And through him, all things were created. Jesus isn't just a prophet as he is believed to be in Islam. No, he's actually the creator of the universe himself. And he is the, in, 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 in Colossians it says, he is the image of the invisible God. If you have seen Jesus, you have seen the Father. Isn't that what Jesus himself said? And F Colossians says, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. All things were created by him and for him. Jesus Christ is the creator of the universe. That's why we can worship him. We're not just worshiping a man or a prophet. We are actually worshiping the one who made us. And when it comes to the events in the Old Testament, if you look at all of these from creation, Adam and Eve, Noah, the global flood, Abraham, Moses, all of these, Jesus himself affirmed all of these as real, historical people, places, and events. There's no uh, illusion that Jesus thought these were myths or allegories or, or, or just made up stories, but Jesus accepted those as real people and real events that took place. You know, Jesus was asked a question about divorce, and then, like now, people want to get out of marriage, and so, but Jesus answered his question about divorce relating to a principle about when did this whole marriage business start? Was it started by the government of Canada? No, it was started by God in the Garden of Eden where he said, created male and female. He created male and female explicitly for the purpose of having future generations, of having children. And he said, therefore, God is causing a man and a woman to be united with his wife and let no man put that asunder. This was a divine institution. Marriage is not man's institution, so really man cannot change it, although people do try. Okay? So this is where God uh, started marriage. But he also talks about at the beginning. What happened at the very, very beginning of everything? What did he create? He created Adam and Eve. When were Adam and Eve created? At the very beginning. Not after billions of years of supposed evolution. So Jesus affirmed a Genesis account as it was actually written, and the Jews of that day would, of course, have taken it that way as well. Now, Jesus talks about his coming back. I was just reading an article yesterday about building of the third temple in Jerusalem, which has major significant, uh, you know, significance in the second coming of Christ. Well, Jesus told us what it will be like when he comes back. He says, just as it was in the days of Noah... And, of course, he was the one who built the ark according to God's instructions. So it will also be in the days of the Son of Man, Jesus referring to himself. People were eating, drinking, marrying, and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. So, in other words, people were carrying on as normal. Normal life, 
They saw the ark being built. They thought Noah was a crackpot. They mocked him and laughed at him until the water started inundating the earth and the flood started coming. Then they all of a sudden became believers. And they started knocking on the door of the ark. Noah, Noah, let us in, but it was too late. God had already shut the door a week previous. Jesus was referring to that, and they all knew this story. He says, it's going to be like when I come back again. Everybody's going to be carrying on. Life is normal. Think, ah, oh, where's the promise? You Christians have been saying Jesus is coming back for 2,000 years, yet where is he? And Jesus says, well, it's just going to be like in the days of Noah. So Jesus accepted the account of the global flood as if it was a real historical event, and so did the Jews of Jesus' day. What about the apostles, those who followed on Jesus? Well, the writers of Hebrews also did the same thing. They referred to people like Abel and Cain. Cain and Abel, of course, were the ch children of Adam and Eve. And Enoch and Noah building an ark, as if these were real historical events. And so about Peter did the same thing. Talks about Noah and the ark and that there were eight in it, just like Genesis recounts. And what about Luke, his genealogies, tracing the genealogy of Jesus Christ all the way back to the very beginning, which was Adam. Adam, the son of God, according to the scriptures. This is exactly what the Bible teaches us. And Paul was talking about Eve and the serpent as if these were real historical accounts. And so Jesus, all the apostles, all took Genesis and all the Old Testament as it was written. In fact, the entire church did up till recently. In fact, uh, Dr. Jonathan Sarfati from Creation Ministries, now uh, retiring, he wrote in his book called Refuting Evolution, refuting Dr. Hugh Ross, I'll mention him in a minute. He says, the vast majority of exegetes, that is interpreters, from the early church fathers through the reformers and up to the early 19th century believed that creation days were 24 hours long. Even those that did not accept literal days erred in the opposite direction from Ross, that is Dr. Hugh Ross, by allegorizing, allegorizing the six days into an, into an instant. So their question in the time of the reformers was not, why did, what was, why did it take God so long? Why did it take him six days? They were asking, why didn't God do it in an instant? Which is a very good question, because if God is almighty, why did he take six days? Seemed like an awful long time when you could have done it in an instant. So Dr. Sarfati, uh, the reason I mentioned Dr. U. Ross, because he is very popular in the evangelical circuits in the United States. Many people have him on at university campuses. Dr. U. Ross does not believe in an atom the way he does not believe in Genesis. In fact, he does not believe in the global flood. And so the book uh, Refuting Evolution takes us through that, as well as I mentioned another book also by Dr. Sarfati, excellent resource. I believe, Pastor, you have this book as well. Ex on the first six chapters of Genesis, the theological, scientific, and philosophical issues related to that. Excellent book if you are interested in this topic. So about six days. Now, a lot of people said, well, come on, Gus, you know, this is 2022. Who believes in six days? Well, Jesus did, the apostles did, the church did, so I like to be among that number. But let's look at Genesis, what it talks about, six days, and what happened on the first day. What was made on the first day? Well, it was light, earth, space, and time. These all came to existence. How does God define that first day? by light and darkness, day and night, evening and morning. So three ways in which God is defining the length of a day. What happens when you have light and darkness cycle, day and night, evening and morning? That is a normal day. I believe that, we believe that that is what God is doing, is defining what a day is so that people wouldn't be having these arguments to 6,000 years later saying, exactly how long was the day? Was it a million years, 10 million years, 10 billion years? No, it was the cycle of light, darkness, day and night, evening and morning. And of course, that is the sentiment throughout all the creation account, six normal days. And in fact, as you go into Moses, God has given ten commandments. The fourth one was related to the Sabbath. And it says, remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. For, God says, in six, six days you shall labor and do all your work. For in six days... The Lord made the heavens and the earth to see and all is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Now, this is written in by the very hand finger of God. You can't get a more direct message from God. And what did God say? God said, for in six days the Lord created the heavens and the earth. 
You want higher authority? You aren't going to get it because this is it. Okay? God said he took the six days. And that's why you work six days and take the seventh off. And for 6,000 years, it has worked. Six days is, has no astronomical correlation, unlike the years and the months. Okay? We only get six days or seven day week from the Bible. Very interesting though. Well, what else do we get from the Genesis account? What we get is the origin of death. I know about 13 people who died of COVID, either directly or indirectly. Um, so this, is, this wasn't just an academic or a theological issue. It, people really die. Uh, yesterday was 29 years since my dad died of cancer. So why? Why do people die? Is that just the way it, it is and que sera, sera and you know, make the best out of your life? Or is this abnormal? To the Christian, this is abnormal. Why? Because that's not the way God made the universe. God made the universe perfect. Every day of creation, he said, God made it, and it was good, very good. Because there was no sin and death and evil. There was no pain. There was no crime. It was, it was literally paradise. But what happened? God said to Adam and Eve, listen, you have the run of the place. You can do everything and anything. You just take care of the garden. There's only one thing I don't want you to do. You see that tree in the middle of the garden? The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you do eat of that tree, you are going to die. Adam, you remember this. This is very important. This is critical. If you do this, you're going to die. Okay. All right. Well, of course, we know the story. The serpent comes along and tells Eve, did God really say? Can you really believe God? I'm paraphrasing a bit here, right? Can you really believe God? Do you trust God? Is God telling you the truth? Or is he withholding something from you? Maybe God knows that if you do eat of the fruit of this tree that your eyes are going to be opened. You're going to be like God. You're going, to, it, you're going to blow your mind. God is holding out on you. He doesn't want you to have all these good things. That was the deception of Satan. And so based on this deception, Eve ate, she gave it to Adam, and then guess what? Then their eyes were open. In other words, then they really understood. And what was the first thing they did? They ran and hid. They ran away from God because they knew that what they had done was evil. God given, gave them a conscience by which they could know what they were doing was wrong. And so what happened? God says, Adam, you disobeyed. You can't blame anybody, Adam. You can't blame your mother or father. You can't blame your schooling. You can't blame your age. I mean, literally, he's the only one who was born yesterday. But you can't, you know, you can't blame anything. Adam, you, out of your own free will, chose to deliberately not obey me, not listen to me. You believe my arch enemy. And for that, Adam, you know the consequence. The consequence is death. Physical, spiritual, eternal death as a result of Adam's sin. This is what cursed humanity. Instead of living forever, ever, we're now going to die. And we are dying. We're dying literally by the billions. What's the hope? What is the hope? If we're all going to die, by default, we're dying. We need some hope to give us life. Whereby can we get eternal life? If we do all these good works, if we pray five times a day, 17 prayers for the entire life, do we have any guarantee we're going to go to heaven? Absolutely not. What can give us hope for eternal life? Right? That is the question. And the Apostle Paul in his, in his gospel related in 1 Corinthians, for since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. Adam, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. It is only, only, only through Jesus Christ that you can have eternal life. There is no other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. That is what drove the Apostle Peter to defy the Sanhedrin, to go out and preach, even though he knew what was happened to him, that they would be punished. Right? And that's why the Iranians are preaching in Iran, even though they could end up in prison or worse. And uh, I'll actually be bringing the speaker here on June 1st. Okay? So this is, this is why it compels people to share the gospel, because without it, people are lost. This is the driving point of mission. We are literally bringing life to people. Are you?
part of that. That's a good question. You know, the creation account is referred to 249 times in the entire Bible. Genesis, the first 11 chapter of Genesis, set the foundation for the rest of the Bible. It sets the foundation for the gospel message. It sets the foundation for the Messiah. It isn't just people to say, oh, forget about that, because it's not a salvation issue. Absolutely it is a salvation issue, because that's where we understand what salvation is from. What are we being saved from? It's from eternal death brought about by Adam's sin. Without that, we have Jesus dying across for no real reason other than that he, uh, you know, uh, got in, in trouble with a bunch of the religious leaders. Right? That's why people don't understand the gospel, because they don't understand the need for the gospel. That's what it, we have to have. Okay? So Genesis is not just a book of beginning. It is the foundation for the rest of Scripture. This is where we get all the major doctrines of Christianity. Undermine a historical Genesis, and you undermine those doctrines. This is why Genesis is one of the most attacked books in the entire Bible, and that's what the theory of evolution does. It undermines the Genesis account, which undermines the gospel. And that might explain why more and more people are abandoning Christianity because they don't see any relevance to it. We will talk about that. Some people say, well, why don't you Gus and the other, why do you make such extreme polarization? Why can't we just all get along? We'll have evolution, creation. Let's put them together. Everybody's going to be happy, right? That sounds like it could be a solution, but it actually is a disaster. Okay. Because it only goes one way, actually. So there are those people who actually want to encourage you. They're actually profess those are organizations of Christians who want to help you to embrace evolution. Not just a little bit, the whole thing. In fact, the, uh, Dr. Francis Collins, the former head of the Human Genome Project, former uh, director of the National Institute of Health, you may have seen him, really uh, US government pronouncements on COVID. He started an organization called BioLogos, and BioLogos says this, we at BioLogos believe that God used the process of evolution to create all the life on Earth today. We at BioLogos agree with the modern scientific consensus on the age of the Earth and evolutionary development of all species, seeing these as descriptions of how God created. He calls this evolutionary creationism. So professors who are associated with him are at evangelical Christian colleges, like Trinity Western, Wycliffe, uh, Wheaton and others, they are there influencing the church to accept evolution lock, stock, and barrel. Okay. You might, this might explain why some of the difficulties in the evangelical church related to this question, because there's some people wanting you to accept the whole thing. But what is the fallout from this type of teaching? Number one, it goes against what Jesus, the apostle, and the church have historically said. So there is one major problem. The other thing is that it undermines the Bible. So if you were to ask Biologos if they believe that, they would say, no, Adam never existed. There never was a biblical Adam. The Genesis account is a myth, and there was no global flood and no Noah. They just jettisoned the whole 11 chapters of Genesis and say it's just a story, a fairy tale. Somebody made it up because the people back then weren't smart enough to realize the real story, so God had to give them this little fairy tale about something, right? That's not how Jesus the apostles took it. Okay. And if you were to ask uh, some of, there was on a Biologos forum a number of years ago, Dr. Kenton Sparks, who teaches the next generation of Christian leaders, he says, if Jesus, as a finite being, erred from time to time, there's no reason at all to suppose Moses, Paul, John wrote scripture without error. In other words, do they hold to the infallibility and errancy of scripture? Absolutely not. They basically said Jesus made mistakes, everybody else made mistakes, but the only one who's not making a mistake is Kenton Sparks and those who follow him, right? Because he knows where all the errors are, right? That's basically what they're saying. So basically, if you go to a school like this, are you even likely to come out a Christian? Certainly not one that believes the Bible. Okay? This is the state of the art today in the evangelical circles. We're not talking liberal denomination. Theistic evolution, progressive creationism, the gap theory, evolutionary creationism, and every other scheme that forces millions of years and evolution onto the Genesis narrative 
denies that Adam's sin brought death into the world and thus renders meaningless Jesus' death as the payment for Adam's sin and for ours also. So in other words, we are saying that in order for the gospel to maintain integrity, you have to take it as it is written from the very first verse. You know, Creation Ministry put together this pamphlet on the survey about uh, young people, and uh, some of these are American, but um, 62% of Americans express belief in human evolution, including 53% of Christians. Actually, it's not much different than uh, the non-Christians, right? So, also among Canadian youths, 70% of youth across Canadian denominations indicate they strongly agree that the teachings of science and religion often ultimately conflict with each other. They're taught science in school. They're hardly taught religion anywhere. And so what do they think is the predominant view? Right? And uh, half of church-going teens in the USA, the church seems to reject much of what science tells us about the world, i.e. What, what I'm teaching you today. And nearly all American youth associate science and ev with evidence and proof, but associate religion with blind faith and private subjective opinion. This is how oftentimes how it is portrayed. If you're religious, well, that's just your opinion idea. Science, objective, all fa facts. Well, that's not quite the way we see it. So the good news is there are scientifically accurate and biblically faithful answers to the question uh, that caused people to abandon Christianity but many churchgoers don't know about them. That's why we're here. So why do we, what do we offer? I'm gonna ask the people get ready to distribute the clipboard here. So we offer a, quite a number of resources for uh, people to gain uh, resources here. Uh, and if you pass out the clipboards, okay. okay, all you need to do, this is our info bites. It comes out uh, once every week. And if you'd like to keep uh, aware of what's going on in ministry, any news article, there's, uh, just sign info by, just put your name and uh, uh, email address on that. Okay? So just uh, take them and then pass them on to the back. The ushers don't need to remain. They just pass it on to the people behind you. Okay. Okay. So what about the science? That's one of the questions that always comes up with people. And this is one of the things that I argue with a lot of people. I would use say argue. Yeah, it's probably a good word. Argue on YouTube and Facebook because a lot of people have uh, different views on uh, what really is science. So science has multiple variations of it. We want to discuss a few of them just as an intro. So when we talk about science, we talk about, for example, empirical science. This is the type of science that can be done in the lab where if someone has a hypothesis, they can prove it is true or at least it's, it's strong support for it, by doing some evidence and having some observations about their, that experiment, okay? Fully endorse this type of science. This is how we get the, uh, you know, the astronauts to go into space and how we can verify that anti vaccines actually work, okay? But in order for this type of science to take, to be, take place, you have to do the experiments and you have to observe the results. So this, and this is, of course, this is, happens all around the world. There's no problem. This is the normal science you study in school and with the scientific method, et cetera. But a lot of time when people say, well, science has proven events related to the past, it is not possible to do that. Why? Because when they're actually talking about events in their past, they're talking about history. History is non-repeatable. You cannot put it in a lab. You can't observe it. It's gone. It's over. It's a one-time thing. Okay? So what, how do you know about what happened in the past? Well, you know it because somebody might have told you. Uh, yesterday, uh, you know, with my grandchildren, and we went and visited and made some visits. Okay. So we have some oral testimony, or somebody writ wrote something down. The Bible is written testimony, history of the earth, what happened, and of course, God's word, so I guess we have a good author for it. Okay, And of course, it is not repeatable. So I can apply science to the past. But we also have this thing called forensic science. Most of you have heard about forensic science. You watch any kind of television show in which you have a courtroom drama. So this is a combination of empirical science and history. 
The empirical science looks at things like, you know, DNA, fingerprints, bone, other artifacts. They can take them into the lab and they can do some experiments on it to verify if it is actually the DNA from said person or if it's a fingerprint from somebody else, etc. So these are the types, and you can repeat this experiment over and over again. This is usually not where the drama comes into the courtroom, but it comes into the, the his history behind it. Somebody needs to make a scenario about to explain the evidence, how it got there, why did this happen, etc. Okay, so they're trying to put it together. And to illustrate this, so here we have a courtroom drama. A crime has been committed, a gun has been fired, happens in Montreal, and so the gun is taken to a lab to analyze when the barrel striations, etc. Well, did the bullet come from that gun? Yes, it did. You can do this test 100,000 times, you're going to have the same result. Okay, so it's brought into the courtroom and they said this is a gun, everybody agrees, no problem. But what they are discussing is the scenario in which the gun was fired. And this related to history, it's not repeated. Okay, so one arguing that, well, it's your client, somebody saw your client was the one who fired the gun. And the other person said, well, it couldn't be my gun because my client's in a wheelchair. So they're both arguing from... They're not contradicting that there was a gun and had been fired. They're arguing the circumstances and the history surrounding it. Okay? And in order for proper justice to take place, both sides need to provide explanation. If you only have one side giving an explanation, you are going to be biased and you are not going to get at the truth. This, unfortunately, is what we have in the scientific world today. There is only one explanation, and that explanation has nothing to do with God. To simplify it, if God is in any shape, manner, or form postulated in this scientific discussion, it is ruled inadmissible, even if, in fact, it actually happened that way. That's why we have this bias in science. Simply say, now this was not how the original framers of modern science viewed this. They didn't see the world like that. They saw the world as being created by God and man trying to uncover all the order and complexity and design in nature. But science had been corrupted to the place where only non-supernatural events are permitted. So obviously the courtroom was biased. So of course uh, when you have, if you look at a guy like Charles Darwin, postulated a view of history without reference to God. And many people liked this because God was excluded from the picture. Right? But if the biblical view is true, then the evolutionary view cannot be true. If God made everything in six days according to biblical account, then obviously humans could not have evolved from some ape-like ancestor over millions of years. It's either one or the other. Now, a lot of people say, well, evolution is so un indisputable. Nobody argues against it. I don't know if you ever run across that. Maybe it's just me. People said, how can you, in 2022, I thought you were an educated person. How can you deny evolution? It's actually not us, the creationists, who are denying or having trouble with evolution. It's the secular media. I mean, if New Scientist says that Darwin was wrong, who am I to argue? And in, uh, recently I came across this article that says, new artificial evolution research could finally prove Darwin was right. Could finally prove him right? And yet we were told for the last 150 years that he, he's been right all along. And yet somebody's looking and saying, well, you've been had, folks. But don't let anybody know is that we're not even sure he's right to this very day as admitted by this non-creationist article. You know, and even if you go and study in high school about how evolution, biological evolution happens, well, we have natural selection, which actually creationists have no problem with natural selection, but it's not evolution. We'll talk about some other time. But natural selection, we're told, selects some beneficial mutation so that a dinosaur will replace its short little stubby front legs with eventually becoming wings. In fact, dinosaurs are believed to exist today. They're called birds. That's literally what they're called. They're called non -avian, they're called avian dinosaur. Okay? So we're told that this is natural selection, capturing these beneficial mutations, and that's what gives us all the new design characteristics that have brought us to here. 
including you. So you would think that this was taught all around the world. I mean, this is, everybody believes that. Well, except some people don't. And so the Discovery Institute put out this survey and asking scientists to subscribe their name to it called a scientific dissent from Darwinism. It's the, the thing they're signing is that we are skeptical of claims for the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for Darwinian theory should be encouraged. But this is what they're being taught in schools, in high school, in CGEPT, in universities. Except that over a thousand PhD scientists, including from McGill, have said, we don't think that this works. If these are the smart people, we're supposed to know how it works, why should I disagree with them? Right? Interesting, one person says, Darwinism was an interesting idea in the 19th century when hand-waving explanation gave a plausible, if not properly scientific, framework into which we could fit biological facts. However, what we have learned since the days of Darwin throws doubt on natural selection's ability to create complex biological systems, and we still have little more than hand-waving as an argument in its favor. This is not a creationist. This is a secular PhD at some university saying this. Wow. And you know, we're told that we evolved from ape-like ancestors over millions of years. And they say, well, look, if you go on Discovery and National Geographic, all this evidence and National Geographic magazine, I've been looking at them since I was a kid, all these uh, fossil evidence. Wow. You know, we've had all of this over the years. We have more and more. And you'd think the picture would become clearer, step by step, how from some last common ancestor about seven million years ago, we slowly came through the Ospelis. Dolopithecus, this, and uh, until we have through today Neanderthals, etc., we have all this evidence, they say, and guess what the conclusion is? It says it's a mess. This is from the American Museum of Natural History. Couldn't get more evolutionary bias than this. And so one of the guys says, when you look at the narrative for hominid, hominid origins, that's us, it is just a big mess. There's no consensus whatsoever said Sergio, this guy, a senior research scientist at the American Museum of Natural History, Division of Anthropology. Overall, the researchers found that most stories of human origins are not compatible with the fossils that we have today. Interesting. So what you're told in the media, National Geographic, has little to do with the actual scientific evidence. In fact, it's a lot of storytelling. This is what it is. So when people said, well, you know, all this evidence, I can't believe the Bible, no, with all this evidence, there's more reason to believe the Bible because it is actually a mess. For those of you really interested, there's a book, Contested Bones, goes through this in great detail. I've read it, it's solid stuff. Okay, it's downstairs available in the library. Now, you remember I talked to you about the beginning about this four legged whale, alleged ancestor between a land animal and a, the modern whale, the blue whales, and, uh, you know, so they're saying that, so. I saw this and I thought, wow, this is very interesting because people around the world who only read the headlines are going to say, listen, there's evidence. They got the fossil evidence, the transitional form between a land animal and a whale. Latest news. Well, let's just see what exactly they found. What they found are those items in red. Hard to see here, this. Okay, that's all. Part of the skull and a vertebrae. What they did not find was any legs or tail. Think about that. A four-legged whale having no tails and no uh, having no tail and no legs. Hard to make the claim that it was actually anything other than a creature with had a head and vertebrae. Okay, but it shows you now the media. Oftentimes, now the actual scientific article showed this fossil. Didn't say anything about that proves this thing, but the media took it, and since most people only read the headlines, they're thinking that the scientists have actually covered it. The scientists did not cover it, uh, have this evidence. Right? Strange, when you actually have to resort to fraud and deception in order to convince people that evolution is true. And unfortunately, there's many scientists who know this and keep their mouth shut because they're afraid to lose their jobs. Okay. Well, if the Bible is true, Okay. What can we say? And we're going to cover a few things here. If the Bible is true, then the universe had a definite beginning, 
then there is created design and order in the universe. Animals and humans produce according to their kind. Natural processes, like natural selection, cannot evo evolve no new kinds. Sedimentary rock layers were laid down quickly during the global flood. Fossils found in those layers must be of matching age, of course, if they're in the rock layer. Dinosaurs cannot be millions of years old, and current world population fits with Noah as, a common for, as our common forefather. We're going to go through this very quick because of time. So was there a definite beginning of the universe? Yes. Okay, evolutionary Big Bang, by the way, if anybody hangs their hat on the Big Bang theory, it is a theory that is falling apart very quickly. Okay, a lot of Christians even say that. Oh, the Big Bang is good evidence for the existence of God. I'm sorry, it's not. Big Bang relies on dark matter. Dark matter makes, without dark matter, there is no Big Bang. They found no dark matter. And so Big Bang is going to go bust in a short period of time, just as a warning, okay? Do we believe there was a definite beginning of the universe? Yes. Okay. And we believe that it was 6,000 years ago, and then 1,600 years later, there was a global flood. We do believe that, of course, that the universe is expanding. The Hubble Space Telescope and redshifting, yes, the universe is expanding. But God, how, they're saying, well, how can this happen? Explain it naturally. We're not going to explain it naturally because God did it supernaturally. And there's no natural explanation for supernatural events. Now, you have, to, you have to take this on faith. You're certainly not going to prove it. In fact, a lot of the stuff and talk about Big Bang is unprovable. Okay. No way you could do it. All right, so the universe has a definite beginning. Again, it proves that the Bible talks about, and scientists do actually believe the universe has a definite beginning. But some are changing their mind. So there should be design and order in the universe that we see. However, Dr. Richard Dawkins, the world's most famous atheist, says, no, no, no. The universe that we observe has precisely the properties we expect if there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but pitiless indifference. But is that the universe, the world that we actually see? No evil, no good? I mean, do you ever listen, turn the news on, watch television? Is there no evil, no good? Of course, all these things, okay? In fact, when we look at the world, we see, and this was the, mod, the, the founders of modern science, were looking at the universe because they believed God had put order and design and meaning in the universe. They were trying to uncover what it was. How did God, you know, how does it all work? How does all of this stuff work? Like, how do trees grow? How do they reproduce? And you look at all of these things, and you look at people, including this adorable little boy, Oh, he's just one of the most adorable grandchildren any grandfather could have. Right? He's a year now. Uh, actually, tomorrow he'll be a year old. Little Lincoln. Oh, so cute. Yes. I have another one here as well. So are you telling me that this creature has no meaning? If you do believe that, if you really believe that the universe has no meaning, if you really believe that people have no meaning, how are you going to treat them? Kind of what we are treating people like today, right? But when you look at the world that God has created, I, I've been in aviation for 45 years. I flew planes, worked on planes, taught about planes, and I can tell you that any aerodynamicist will look at this and think this is a fantastic biological flying machine. Incredible. All by accident? I don't think so. Okay. When you look at even study, people who study biology, the cell and all that works inside, it's like mind-boggling. I, I can't even keep up with the names they use. Right? And yet, these are biological factories. Even the simplest organism is a horrendous biological factory. Anybody study this in biology? Right? It's easy, right? Piece of cake. Just happens like that. Actually, they're all just thrown together, and poof, there it is. Wow, I don't think so, because it all has to work all together, right, in harmony with one. Exactly the way we would expect if God had put all this order, design, and meaning in, 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 in creation. And what about, Darwin actually thought that from some or organism that somehow came to life in some primordial soup billions of years ago, somehow life came out and things just started gradually changing changing creatures, all of it, so to be a gradualism. That's what he called gradualism. Gradually things would change so that you would actually never have really different kinds of animals. In fact, you would have a whole 
cacophony of animals, all different varieties mix and match together, okay, such as this bird baboon and this golden receiver, all of these. Why is it that creatures are actually created according to reproduce after their kinds? Evolution should not have creatures according to their kinds. Even when we dig up fossils, when you dig up fossils, they can tell what kind of creature it is. It's amazing. And that's exactly the way God created things according to their kinds. Of course, that affirms the Bible. Well, what about the sedimentary rocks? We see the sedimentary rocks around the world, sedimented out of water. Some people say, well, the global flood, or the flood of Noah was just local in the Middle East. Yeah, but sedimentary rocks are the remains of the flood. And they cover 75 to 90 percent of the Earth's surface are covered by rocks sedimented out of water. That's why we call it a global flood, because it's all over the world. Okay? No matter where you go, you find these sedimentary rocks. Well, how do you explain that? You've got a lot of water moving. Well, that's exactly what you're seeing here. So I'm not sure if it comes out that clear here. There's a little video here. Actually, experiments have been done in a laboratory in the University of Wisconsin showing moving water. Um, I don't, can't see it's washed out here, but there's all the strata is automatically created as water moves along, the sediment sorts out and uh, into all the strata and layers that you see along the sides of the roads and in the mountains. Exactly what you would expect from the flood of Noah. Also, further evidence of Mount St. Helens. I don't know if anybody have been to Mount St. Helens, but uh, I hear it was a real blast. <laughs> At the time, anyway, it was 1980 when it first erupted. It was southeast of um, uh, Washington State. We visited that, my wife, in the year 2000, and uh, literally the top blew off with the force 1,600 times that of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Right? So this was level trees 10 miles away. There was a number of people who thought it wouldn't affect them. They are now buried in that area. And so the material that came off the mountain came down in what's called pyroclastic flows and made up to about 600 feet of material on the bottom. Okay, in the distance, you can see here, in this distance here is the uh, material that was laid down in 1980. Up to 600 feet, about 200 meters worth. In 1982, there was another eruption, which again sends the melting snow down the mountain, and it actually carved the canyon down through the material that was laid down in 1980. So here you can see this. This is the material that was laid down in 1980, and this canyon here was created in 1982. How do we know? We saw it. People act literally observed this happening. If you did not know this canyon was created in 1982, and you came across it, you would say, well, that canyon, you would say, how long did that river take to carve this canyon? Well, I say it's a little river, so it takes a little bit. It's going to take millions of years to carve that canyon. But that's not how it happened, because we were there. So let's take a little bit of a closer look in this area here. And you can see, what do we see? All the strata. Not so clear in this picture, but all the strata laid out. This was laid out in 1980, since most of you were born, or many of you were born. So if you didn't know what actually happened, you would say, well, how long did it take all the strata to accumulate? Well, millions of years, because when we look at Grand Canyon, we see all the strata accumulate. We say, it takes two billion years. But the evidence shows quite clearly that this type of thing can happen within our lifetime. Okay? It doesn't take billions of years. In fact, this happened in one year. Okay? Hmm. For further evidence, the, is Genesis History is an excellent resource, an excellent book. I'll tell you it's on Netflix, but don't tell I heard that. But you can buy it downstairs. It's a wonderful, excellent series. Uh, and also we have a DVD on the Genesis, on the Mount St. Helens. Excellent resource for that. What about fossils? We're told that fossils took, well, I talked at the beginning, thousands of years to, to uh, turn into fossils, but that's not so. In fact, this is clearly evidenced by the fossils themselves, because if a creature dies, What's going to happen? It starts to decay process right away unless it is preserved right away by fossilization. So fossilization is by definition a almost instant process, a very rapid process. In fact, 
if you want, I have a fossilized teddy bear here. I picked it up in England. Three months earlier, this had been soft, cuddly teddy bear. Now it is rock. So downstairs, if you come, you'll be able to see that. So how long does it take to turn something into rock? Well, obviously, very, very short period of time. And what about dinosaurs? We're always told that dinosaurs died out millions of years ago. Well, if the dinosaurs are found in those rock strata, and those rock stratas were laid down in Noah's flood, which happened about less than 5,000 years ago, Therefore, the dinosaurs were alive about 5,000 years ago, which would have made sense because they would have lived before the flood, and some of them got buried in the flood. So therefore, dinosaurs were not millions of years old, as we repeatedly and nauseamly told, but died out something like 5,000 years ago. In fact, there's evidence some of them may have lived until recently. Probably not the big one. Okay, but what evidence do we do have that actually dinosaurs are of recent, within thousands of years rather than millions of years? Well, it's a good question. I'm glad you asked that because in 2005, Dr. Mary Schweitzer was digging through some unfossilized Tyrannosaurus rex bones. Tyrannosaurus rex, the bones didn't, weren't rock. They were like regular dead animal bones. And as she was digging through that, she found this material. This is organic material. And uh, flexible and resilient when stretch returned to its original shape. Everybody, all the scientists around her said, oh, Dr. Schweitzer, come on. These dinosaur bones are millions of years old. How can organic material remain? That's impossible. According to everything we know about science, you must have had some contamination in your lab. So she went back to the lab and did this analysis. Ten years later, she came out and said, listen, I've done every protocol. And yes, it's not only these, but there are many others organic material in dinosaur bones. And she says, well, you look, they are virtually indistinguishable from tissue samples from modern species. And she said, when you think about it, the laws of chemistry and biology and everything else that we know say it should be gone, it should be degraded completely. We agree 100% with what she said because this is what science tells us. So what the response of the scientific community? Oh, guess what? Organic material can last millions of years. <laughs> they had to. Because any scientist who had said that dinosaurs died out thousand years ago, they'd say, sir, there's the door. We don't like that kind of language in our university. So one last thing, Pastor, if I can. You don't have much choice. I'm in control. So. <laughs> <laughs> All right, one last thing, human population. I like this one because it refers to people and you being people. How many people in the world today? I'd give you an exact number, but it keeps changing. It's about 8 billion people here today. A lot of people. Now, if I believed in evolution and that humans have been around for at least a million years, I'd say, well, on and off population going up and down, it would take over a million years to get 8 billion people here. But I'm not an evolutionist. I'm a biblical creationist. I believe the Bible. And I say that, that about 4,500 years ago, the flood of Noah occurred, and only eight people survived, and only six of them were going to have kids. So that means that I only have 4,500 years from three couples to get 8 billion people. You see the problem? And this comes back to a courtroom drama. I got 8 billion people for sure. I got 4,500 years to get... 8 billion, or I got a million years to get 8 billion. Which is most likely correct? That's a good question. Well, so what did you do? Well, you're going to look at population statistics on the web or whatever, and you look at these population growth charts. I got this from the BBC, not the Better Bible Company, but the British Broadcasting Corporation. Unfortunately, no longer have this chart available. I don't know. They took it off. And I thought, well, this chart is extremely interesting because it looks like a creationist drew it. How so? Well, on the right-hand side, the vertical column is in billions of people. And it's off the chart on the top, 8 billion. I put the cross on there so you can see when Jesus was. On, and about 4,500 years ago, we had a dip, roughly the time of the flood of Noah. Not dipped enough, but it doesn't really matter. But what I was very interesting, where the BBC said there was two people. About 6,000 years ago. I mean, this was... Looks like it taken right out of the Bible. I couldn't believe it when I saw it. I said, yeah, it is the BBC. Huh, go figure. Okay. So 
So this is what BBC is saying. How does that make? Now you'll notice that the population growth on the right here was very rapid. This is typical of these population growth, exponential growth. You see, within the last thousand years, our population has gone from, you know, a billion to eight billion. Now, if it keeps up at that rate, how many people are going to be here in a hundred years from now? Two hundred years, a thousand years from now. How many people would be here? Which is a good question. So let me just put it another way. Supposing creation didn't take place 6,000 years ago, let's say it took 7,000 years ago. And the flood, instead of being 4,500 years ago, let's say it was 5,500 years ago. So let's say we just shifted everything 1,000 years earlier. Okay? So you can see the population growth here going to whoop, whoop, whoop. How many people would be on the earth today? Now, this is technically not, physically not possible. But how many people are, would be here on the earth today? Roughly 450 billion people. And that's only for 1,000 years earlier than the biblical account. How do you explain people being around for a million years? How do you explain that? Well, humans were at extinction level for, which isn't possible. Biologically, genetically, it's not possible. Or that the population went up to the billions, when, went extinct, repeat, 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 of which there would be tons of evidence. In fact, there's zero evidence. So this fits in pretty much well perfectly with the biblical account. So this is the BBC is endorsing the Bible. Don't tell them I said so. <laughs> so in conclusion, what can we say? Jesus affirmed as historical and real the people, places, and events in the Old Testament, including the events of Genesis, creation, Adam, and Eve, the fall, and the global flood. The apostles taught this, the historic church taught this, and Jesus' followers should also teach this. Compromising Christian influencers, of which there are a number, deny God's revealed truth, and in fact, put their own spin on this and undermine the Bible. The science and the Bible are actually not in conflict. Bad science is. Science supports the biblical view of creation, and we will argue that it does not support the evolutionary view of origins, if you're allowed to hear both sides of the argument. And a quote by the late Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, I think, is uh, quite telling. There can be no doubt whatsoever that all the troubles in the church today, and there are many, and most of the troubles in the world are due to a departure from the authority of the Bible. And one of the reasons why people abandon the Bible is because of the theory of evolution. That's why I'm so glad that your pastor and the church agreed to have us speak today. And uh, so how can you equip yourself? I've just covered the tip of the iceberg. As there's, there's lots and lots more. But one of the things you can do is avail yourselves of the resources. The pastor and church have agreed for young people and youth to have free resources. Uh, go downstairs. <clears throat> but one of the ones we recommend highly is our creation magazine. It builds faith. It answers questions. It teaches how science supports scripture. It inoculates Christians against, uh, inoculates against evolution. Your kids, if they're in public education, they're going to be hit with evolution every which way and other things as well. Right? Got a children's section, the widest range of topic of any resource, no paid advertising, and it actually is delivered to your door. I have one of those mailboxes in my house, so it comes right to my house. Right? So many, I highly encourage you, now it comes out four times a year, so if you want to keep up with going on in the, in the whole question of creation and evolution, this is the excellent resource for you. And how much does it cost, you're going to ask? It costs $7.50 every three months, so a total of $30 a year, which is for four magazines. Hard copy, you actually get a physical copy uh, every, every three months. You also get a digital version, so you can put up to five devices. And if you sign up today, you get a free issue. And uh, you also get a free DVD if you sign up today. So I'm going to ask the ushers to get ready with the clipboards. Okay. And uh, if you want to pass those out. And how does it work? Well, there's a tear-off form, and uh, so on one side, take the bottom one, you put your personal information, and then on the bottom, on the other side, put in the payment information, uh, such as information on a checking account or a credit card. Then you have to bring the form downstairs to my wife, and then she'll get your magazine and your DVD. 
So go ahead and just hand them out uh, and then pass them around. Take a form and then pass along uh, to the back, if you would, please. Okay. Some of the other resources available, answers, uh, the answers book, 60 the most often asked questions on creation and evolution. Uh, this is a very popular book available for youth and young people. There's another book also available, Faith. Uh, it's called uh, Christianity for Skeptics. It deals with things like Hinduism and Buddhism and Islam, etc. Also an excellent book. If you buy both of them, you get a discount on the purchase of both. There's another resource I mentioned before, the Genesis account. Uh, excellent resource uh, for those of you who want solid documentary material. There's also a DVD series on the Genesis account. Uh, you, I've taken a class through this. It's very good, very in-depth. Um, there's also, for those of you who want just the science stuff, nothing with the Bible, this is our PhD scientist that put together this, uh, Evolution's Achilles Heel. Highly re if you're into sciences, this is the book for you. It also comes with a DVD in a, in a DVD, and if you buy both, you will get a discount if you buy both. And for those of you who say, listen, I want to buy all of this, but just you want to leave stuff for everybody else. So we have a creation starter pack. You get a ton of material, $360 worth of resources for $199, a very great bargain for you. And finally, Creation Magazine, or Creation.com, over 13 faith-building articles. Uh, and we have a free videos that comes out uh, every week or so. And uh, Creation Live. That, ladies and gentlemen, is the end of our presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gus, and uh, we appreciate you being here, and we, uh, we know that there's a lot of information that you, you shared, and it's taking it all in, so just encourage you, do go downstairs, there's lots of books and resources, and uh, take advantage of that offer of kids, parents, teens, uh, that would be wonderful. One of the things that struck me was, in what was said, was that Jesus took a literal view of six-day creation. And, and when you read the New Testament, I think that's really important for us as Christians, you know. If we claim to follow Jesus and take Jesus seriously, then we should take what he said seriously about the creation. And so may that be what you do. May that be what I do. Um, may God bless you. Let me just close in a word of prayer as we uh, begin, as we end this service now. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for the chance to meet like this and uh, we are challenged by many things that were said. Thank you for your word that brings us the truth, that uh, gives us the historical perspective that we need. And I pray that we would uh, dig deeper, that we would uh, wrestle maybe with the doubts or questions that we have, that we would uh, find the answers that, uh, that we can, and that we would grow in our trust uh, of your word. Thank you that your word is trustworthy, that it is reliable that we can uh, take it and believe it because it's from you. And so I pray for my brothers and sisters here, those watching, those listening, that you would help them and encourage them uh, to continue to grow in their faith. In Jesus' name, until we meet again, amen. amen. May God bless you. Have a great day.